Uh, Ted McCormick is here with us today, beaming in from his uh, actual office in, at Concordia University in Montreal. Uh, Ted's research uh, in general focuses on uh, the history of science and technology, uh, as well as political economy and um, empire in uh, early modern Britain, Ireland, and uh, the Atlantic world more broadly. He wrote an excellent book on William uh, Petty and the origins of political arithmetic. And I gather you've continued that project in a book that I understand is forthcoming about uh, changing ideas about uh, the government, about uh, governing populations from uh, basically the 16th to the 18th centuries. And I think I've, I've read parts of that too in some articles uh, mm -hmm. that he's published and so forth. So that, so that, that is, uh, I just highly recommend uh, uh, that work. That's how uh, uh, Ted came on my radar recently. Um, and uh, I guess we'll find out to what extent uh, his next project is uh, you know, probably some combination I'm going to anticipate of a continuation and a departure. Um, but uh, uh, he's working on uh, yet another book about changing idea, oh, sorry, that's about um, technological projects in the English uh, Caribbean, or I don't know. What, are you, are you, are you uh, from the States, but have been living in Canada? I was imagining that we maybe pronounce uh, Caribbean on differently on different sides of the border. Uh, oh, that's fine. Caribbean, Caribbean, have your pick. Anyways, that is uh, the subject or, you know, today's talk is uh, presumably part of that project. Engines of division, land labor, and perpetual motion something for everyone in the mid 17th century English Atlantic. So I'm gonna turn it over uh, to you, Ted, and uh, well, we'll keep it pretty informal, I guess. Uh, you can tell people if you want them to chime in at any point with questions, otherwise we'll do the standard. Uh, Ted will uh, harangue us for a uh, more or less standard amount of time, and then we can uh, talk about his talk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And thanks for the invitation. Um, this is new, as, as you indicated, this is pretty uh, new material at the beginning of uh, what hopefully will be a fairly large project for me. Um, and yeah, I'm interested here in projecting, uh, which is an interest that I've kind of developed uh, working, especially with Vera Keller over the last you know, eight or nine years now. Um, so projects and projecting are coming to be a sort of familiar topic, I guess, but I'm especially interested in the way that projecting uh, deals with different territories. And this is an example in this paper of a project that kind of moves uh, purely on paper, but moves from England to the English Caribbean. And it does sort of interestingly different work in those two places. So that's the sort of hook, I guess, for me. Uh, with this topic. Now, I'm, I apologize because I will be reading a little more than I would like to, partly because it's new. Um, so if you have questions at any point, or if you'd you know, like me to just stop, <laughs> tell me, uh, and I will oblige. Um, and with that, I will begin. The mid 17th century was a period of scientific change, political revolution, and imperial expansion. These were linked in multiple ways. Empire building and long distance trade fostered appropriation and circulation of objects and ideas, created opportunities for observation and experiment. Scientific ideas and practical technologies were instrumental to state building and colonial settlement. The idea that economy and politics conditioned scientific change and were conditioned by technology is scarcely new. What has attracted novel attention from historians of each of these areas in the last 15 years is a set of nodes that connected them in a distinctive way points where new or rediscovered sciences, technologies, economies, and geographies were drawn together in conscious plans for shaping the future. While different historians have used different terms for these intersections, many of them are what early modern English writers called projects. And, oops, sorry. Uh, and here I've just sort of indicated you know, some examples of recent topics for work on projects in the last, uh, 12 years or so. Um, and not all of these works take projecting as their explicit analytical frame, although some do. 
Um, but all of them in some ways deal with the phenomenon that I'm talking about. And although I think probably imperial uh, projects are maybe underrepresented in this list, uh, there's been work on that. Uh, Keith Plymer's recent book on forestry, I think would be an example. Um, and institutional projects are also maybe slightly underrepresented. Well, but Sarah Lloyd's work on charity in the 18th century is a great example of that. In part because it's both an analytical category and an early modern term, projecting is easier to characterize than it is to define. Samuel Johnson wrote in The Adventurer in 1753 that whatever is attempted without previous certainty of success may be considered as a project. Examples included everything from Alexander's campaigns to alchemical transmutation to the voyages of Columbus. However, among the many figures who combined extent of knowledge and greatness of design, Johnson distinguished a species of projectors whose ends are generally laudable and whose labors are innocent. Those who are searching out new powers of nature or contriving new works of art. Like alchemists, these men were often seen as self-seeking charlatans or deluded fools. Yet from such men and such only, Johnson averred, are we to hope for the cultivation of those parts of nature which lie yet waste and the invention of those arts which are yet wanting to the felicity of life. Johnson's discussion highlights several features apparent in projecting a century earlier. Its riskiness, its ill repute, its goal of turning waste into wealth, its promise of progress and its capacity to instruct even through failure. Yet writing from an age of dedicated scientific institutions and an established fiscal military state, Johnson also separated projects that advanced art and science from what he called the sanguinary projects of heroes and conquerors, two things that as earlier observers such as Daniel Defoe and Jonathan Swift well knew, 17th century projects had often fused. One such was William Petty's project, the Down Survey of Ireland. This took shape in the wake of Oliver Cromwell's conquest of the island, whose Catholic population had risen up in 1641 and maintained its independence during the English Civil Wars. Cromwell's army had been paid with promises of Irish land, which now had to be measured and valued. Using an innovative system of organization and instrumentation, including interchangeable parts for surveying equipment, and a crash course in surveying for previously untrained soldiers, the survey covered most of Ireland between 1655 and 1658. Combining the numbers and force of an army with knowledge garnered from local informers, the survey measured boundaries, classified the land in terms of its productivity, and produced rudimentary maps. These feats of instrumentation and organization facilitated the first so-called scientific atlas of the country, and simultaneously the mass expropriation of Catholic landowners and the creation of a lasting Protestant landed elite. The Down survey transformed English knowledge and Irish geography, shaping future relations between the countries and between groups within them. It also made Petty Rich. For most historians, the survey has mattered because it worked. Several other projects of the era, like the English Fen drainage examined by Eric Ash, uh, the construction of the Canal du Midi, which Chandra Mukherjee has traced, or the Roman infrastructure projects looked at by Pamela Long, had comparable effects on land and people at different scales anyway. But most projects as such were less successful on their own terms and less consequential in ours. Indeed, in contrast to the entrepreneurs and experts of later centuries, the term projector was often synonymous in the period with broken promises and half-baked scams. Projecting's interest for historians of science then does not rest on the success of individual examples. Rather, projecting matters because it was a key form of scientific work in which relations between skill and learning, private interest and the public good were overtly problematized and in which the capacity of new knowledge and technology to transform landscapes social relations and even subjectivities to shape the future in complex and specifiable ways was made explicit. In this sense, uh, we might think that projects anticipated what Sheila Jasnoff calls socio-technical imaginaries, which she defines as collectively held, institutionally stabilized and publicly performed visions of desirable futures animated by shared understandings of forms of social life and social order attainable through and supportive of advances in science and technology. The key difference between these modern imaginaries and early modern projects, as I see it, was that the latter lacked the shelter of stable institutions, or to put it another way, such institutions were in the 17th century still projects themselves. In the context of colonial conquest, commercial expansion, and early globalization, 
projects became sites for working out ideas of imperial order and world economy, defining or redefining relations between metropolitan and colonial environments and populations. Some projects took on large scale linkages directly, proposing trades or institutions that would connect far flung territories in new ways. Others brought specific places or people into the realm of metropolitan calculation and control. Still others, and I think machines and mechanical inventions especially kind of fall into this category, still others migrated from place to place, apparently unchanged. Yet as Kapil Raj has argued, if we follow these supposedly immutable mobiles on their journeys, mutations appear, if not in their material form or function, then in the political work they did and the cultural and social embedments they underwent. This is true of projects that crossed real oceans, but it's also true, I argue, of those that traveled only on paper. And it's true whether such projects yielded new forms of hybrid knowledge and mutual exchange, such as Raj describes in South Asia, or whether they mediated new forms of expropriation and domination. In different contexts, indeed, the same project might do both. In the rest of this paper, I'd like to use a somewhat unlikely example to elucidate these claims, a perpetual motion machine. In Leviathan and the Air Pump, Stephen Shapin and Simon Schaffer famously argued that solutions to the problem of knowledge are embedded within practical solutions to the problem of social order. Conversely, solutions to the problem of social order encapsulate contrasting practical solutions to the problem of knowledge. What was true of Robert Boyle's air pump was true of failed inventions too. Perpetual motion was a preeminent example. As Schaffer later showed, different ways of evaluating perpetual motion implied different ways of organizing society. More than this, perpetual motion's changing meanings tracked wider histories of social and cultural change across the early modern period. In the Baroque courts of the 17th century, he argues, perpetual motion machines emblematized the mysterious power of the prince. In the early 18th century marketplace, by contrast, their promise of limitless energy, boundless profit was what counted. By the high enlightenment, however, perpetual motion had become, at least for some, a byword for groundless speculation and popular credulity. Like other pre-modern machines, such as the clock or the balance, perpetual motion did as much work in the realm of metaphor as it did in the physical world perhaps in this case rather more. Schaffer recalls Leibniz's jibe of the theological implications of Newtonian cosmology. It was a pity, Leibniz remarked, that Newton's God had lacked the foresight to make the universe a perpetual motion, but had to wind it up from time to time. For Fontenelle, in his widely read Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds, 1686, the perpetual motion of the heavens was the logical outcome of a Cartesian universe and a reminder of how far the moderns had surpassed the ancients. In short, perpetual motion was a powerful image connoting perfectly crafted, inexhaustible systems of efficiently interacting parts. Yet perpetual motion machines were also solid objects built to do things, or at least they were supposed to be. In 1600, the Elizabethan natural philosopher William Gilbert commented skeptically on the idea of a perpetual motion powered by magnets. May the gods damn all such sham, pilfered, distorted works, which do but muddle the minds of students. Yet even he had to acknowledge reports of real machines. Across the 17th century, philosophers, inventors, and projectors from the Dutch polymath Cornelius Drebbel to the German alchemist Johann Joachim Becker to the English physician turned surveyor turned economic writer William Petty claimed to have produced perpetual motions themselves. Even machines that never materialized or remained incomplete were proposed as practical and profitable technologies rather than mere thought experiments or learned desiderata. While existing literature has emphasized perpetual motion's epistemic, political, and theological implications, the economic dimensions of these projects were central to their appeal. Perpetual motion encapsulated a solution not only to problems of knowledge and order, but also to problems of production. The same decades that saw its rise witnessed rapid changes in economic thought and political economy. In printed pamphlets and treatises from the early 17th century onward, Advocates of commerce gradually discarded static frameworks of the bounded body politic, arguing instead for the possibility of limitless growth through various combinations of territorial or colonial expansion on the one hand, and the intensive uh, technological exploitation or improvement of existing resources on the other. Meanwhile, on the American mainland and in the Caribbean, English, French, Dutch, and other colonizers competing with one another and chipping away at Spanish and Portuguese power set up new plantations. Many of these found their economic justification in the production of exotic commodities such as tobacco, indigo, or sugar. 
Production involved machines, animals, indentured servants, and rapidly growing numbers of enslaved people. At first blush, the pursuit of perpetual motion and the expansion of slavery seem categorically unrelated. The fault here lies with our categories. Recent attention not only to the phenomena of projecting, but also to the discourse of improvement, reveals conceptual ties between technological projects, changes in economic behavior, justifications of empire, and ideas of moral reform. Perpetual motion and colonial plantation were in this sense analogous. Both were interventions that originated outside established institutions and mobilized knowledge and resources from heterogeneous places to generate a transformative set of material and moral effects. Both projects and plantations too attempted to entice investors with private profits while enlisting the power of the state to help deliver public benefits. Besides being analogous, however, these interventions were also historically linked. One case that connects them was the perpetual motion machine designed by 17th century agricultural improver, Cressy Dimmick. While he intended his engine primarily for use in England, Dimmick suggested that it could also assist plantation in Barbados and Virginia. Indeed, that it might work in all places alike. Yet despite this universal promise, perpetual motion's effects were not everywhere the same. While the history of Dimmick's perpetual motion between 1648 and 1660 brings out persistent features of projecting across the early modern period, tracing the machine's specific uses and implications in metropolitan and colonial spaces locates his project in an emerging imperial economy at a crucial moment of change, the emergence of large-scale sugar plantations in the English Caribbean, fed by a rapidly expanding slave trade and justified by an ideology of limitless growth. Concerned as it was with land use, sources of power, and the balance between animal and human labor, perpetual motion shows us how technological projects reflected and reinforced ideas of environmental, social, and racial difference in the 17th century British Atlantic world. Not very much is known about Cressy Dimmock. He was apparently the son of Sir Thomas Dimmock, member of an important Lincolnshire family. It's noteworthy here that uh, he inherited no land of his own, and also that his home ground was a site of fen drainage projects in his youth. So the idea that technology could transform a landscape, change its uses, uh, and thus change its inhabitants will have been familiar, uh, as will the idea that such projects provoke resistance, um, sometimes legal, sometimes not. Dimmock entered Gray's Inn in 1629, and so presumably gained some training in law, but he resurfaces in the historical record only about two decades later, in connection with the Hartlip Circle. Um, this was a pan-European Protestant network of inventors, reformers, philosophers, and projectors centered on the German-born intelligencer Samuel Hartlib, based in London since the late 1620s. Here, Dimmock appears between the end of the English Civil Wars in 1648 or so and the restoration of Charles II, proposing a range of agricultural, alchemical, and mechanical improvements. Everything from saltpeter manufacture and antinomy mining to rabbit breeding, orchards, fish ponds, to new fodder crops and new crop rotations, better plows, seed drills, water mills, carriages, um, you name it. In this confident, frenetic uh, heterogeneity, Dimmick was a typical projector, if there was such a thing. Typically too, his projects were tied both to wider social changes and to one another. One of his best studied schemes, which Hartlib had printed in 1653 and which you have the title page for uh, on the slide, was a plan for dividing farmland on a technologically rationalized basis. Drawing explicitly on the experience of fen drainage, Dimmick sought to standardize large and small estates and set them out concentrically to separate arable pasture and meadow and to maximize the use of marginal land, running canals to farmsteads at the center of each estate. Like many projectors, Dimmick was impatient of English farmers' attachment to what he called their own old customs, which hinders his, hind hindered his experiments with new machines in which he contrasted to the reason and the real experience, uh, his words, that his inventions represented. This was an epistemic complaint, but it was also a political one. Much as another Hart Libyan agriculturalist, Gabriel Platts, had suggested in his utopian tract Macaria in 1641, Dimmick thought that by reason of the general averseness of ignorant farmers and husbandry, it were a noble piece of policy and justice if authority should oblige or compel men into adopting new methods that were, he thought, infallibly true. Like many Hart Libyans too, Dimmick saw the enclosure of land in the topographical sense, but more especially in terms of ownership and control over use 
as a prerequisite to the full exploitation of the Earth's fertility. Competing use rights, like local practices of land management, hindered decision-making and the imposition of techniques proven elsewhere. Enclosure simplified property rights, unified control, and replaced the confusion of a mixed interest in common fields with the clarity of a single owner's single interest. Changing land tenure would change behavior. As he put it, men's minds would be more settled and their affairs would be contracted into order and more moderate and ennobled labor. Enclosure would fix men's minds on their interests, that is, and align their interests with profitable improvements. As Hartlib summarized another of Demick's schemes, if the whole kingdom of England were divided, as it were, into so many possessions or cantons, and each of these fenced and hedged in and planted with trees, etc., it might be made the most flourishing country in the world. As Dimmock put it, the self-interest of the freeholder would make England the garden of the world. Dimmock first mentioned perpetual motion to Hartlib uh, in a letter near the end of 1648, which you have a little uh, image of there. Uh, he gave little hint as to how his machine worked. Uh, this reticence was not by any means unusual. Establishing public confidence in one's abilities uh, while retaining profitable secrets long enough to profit from them was a persistent problem for projectors. To judge from Hartlib's subsequent comments, Dimmick's engine appears to have involved a notched wheel and a set of bellows, so it may have been pneumatic. Um, unsurprisingly, Dimmick cited no precursors. Indeed, he distinguished his effort from the contemporaneous motions of William Wheeler, William Petty, and Caspar Kaltoff, all people associated with Hartlib, um, and emphasized the particular hand of providence, as we'll see in his own invention. However, the early 16th century Italian philosopher, physician, and alchemist Marcantonio Zamara's description of a perpetual motion powered by bellows had been published or republished in Frankfurt in 1625. Now, this is a much later image. Um, uh, that's published in an article about Zamara's motion in Isis. It's a 20th century image um, based on the description that Zamara offered, which was very brief um, and is reproduced uh, in translation on this slide. So yeah, <laughs> it'll be an honor to the integrity of the maker if they're able to make this. But this is you know, something like uh, the way it, it might've been supposed to, to look. So the wheel operates the bellows and the bellows blow the wheel. Um, it's possible that Dimmick learned of this idea directly or through one of his heart Libyan connections, but I can't really say either way. In any case, Dimmick's letter dwelt not on the engine's design, but on its power and on its applications. First, it required no labor beyond oversight, working as he put it, without the help of wind or water, man or beast, except the help of a man to set it first going and look to it while it doth go. Second, the instrument shall move of its own strength to what proportion you please, and that night and day for days, weeks, months, or years, without ceasing of itself till either it be stopped on purpose or some of the materials break or slip. Third, and most important, was the project's multiplicity of uses. These ranged from domestic functions, such as turning of grindstones, winnowing of corn, churning of butter, or the like, to grander tasks, such as draining of waters from Fenland, or powering iron mills, corn mills, sugar mills, oil mills, and moving carriages of all sorts. By 1651, I don't expect you to read all this, this is just you know, to give you an idea of the range of uses. By 1651, when his claims appeared in a printed pamphlet entitled An, Engine of Motion, uh, An Invention of Engines of Motion Lately Brought to Perfection, the list of uses had expanded impressively, now included grinding bark for painters and dyers, brick and stone for builders, pumping water out of fens and mines and into castles and cities, pulling ships and anchors as well as plows and carts, and cutting, turning, polishing, or boring all kinds of wood, stone, and metal. Though its uses might be countless, Dimmick focused on its implications for agriculture, as well as for drainage, I should say. Um, central here was the machine's labor-saving promise, and more especially its substitution of minimal human oversight for intensive animal labor. This appears to have been an abiding concern of Dimmick's, even before he discussed perpetual motion with Hartlib, uh, he claimed to be seeking ways to ease what he called the horse-like labors of barge men by mechanical means. He explained the significance of perpetual motion in this regard in a memo concerning a utility engine. I think I have, oh no, that's it. Um, in this memo, uh, he writes, usually men have in their teams to plow four, five, or six horses, 
and six or eight oxen, with which they plow about one acre a day. With the engine, however, I hope without any horse, with six men only or less, to plow with two plows at once, two acres a day of the same or the like ground. By replacing animal with human labor, a perpetual motion machine would free land for more wheat, sparing the labor of horses, as Dimmick put it, meant sparing the fruits of a great part of the grounds, which are now spent to maintain those horses. Yet even as it saved labor on individual estates, Dimmick intimated that it would employ more people on the land overall, thus preventing the depopulation that was long blamed on enclosure, while easing the pressure of numbers by expanding food production. By this invention, he put it, the land will maintain one third part of men more than now it doth. Estates would profit, the poor would be employed, England would be transformed. Work on the machine proceeded, not without difficulty, through 1649. As he tinkered, Dimmick retrenched his claim to perpetual motion and emphasized instead increased efficiency. In March, he described the project as such a motion as shall want little of moving constantly, and if it fail in that, shall make amends in the strength it goes by and the great ease and advantage that will accrue. If it no longer eliminated animals altogether, it might yet be made to do the work of three or four horses with one. Still, a demonstration was a long way off. By May 1649, Dimmick acknowledged that his wheel had been forced to stand still for want of that sort of bile that could only facilitate the motion. And he worried that those of Wheeler, Kaltoff, and Petty might be superior. Yet he was confident that how much soever his engine shall come short of theirs in such things to which all are applicable, yet mine may be applicable to many purposes to which theirs are not, specifically the draft work of pulling plows and easing land carriage. By September, talk of perpetual motion gave way to what Dimmick now called the great work of joining strength and time together, or simply the marriage of strength and time. If this sounds like making the best of a bad job, that was not how Dimmick or Hartlib saw it. In late October, Hartlib reported, Mr. Dimmick came to me joyfully with the full confirmation of his invention for a perpetuous modus or of time and strength, so that it is now out of all doubt. Like other associates of Hartlib and followers of Francis Bacon, Dimmick couched his work in providential terms. Making England the world's garden meant bringing it closer to the Garden of Eden, not only in its fruitfulness, but also in its faithfulness to God's plan for man as nature's steward, as well as for England as a bastion of Protestantism. Dimmick's motion was not merely a transformative technological achievement then, but a piece of England's reformation. As he refined his claims about the engine's powers and differentiated it from rival projects, he dwelt more and more on the divine inspiration behind it. In May 1649, as progress stuttered, he'd written that from small beginnings, God oft times causes great works by degrees to be made perfect, at that point a pious hope. But by October, he described himself much more extravagantly in the letter uh, on, this, on the slide as the unworthy vessel of a divine blessing. It hath pleased my ever gracious God, he wrote, so far to show forth his strength in my weakness that though not without much expense of time, study, labor, and money, I have obtained the thing I sought for. And being by his appointment some months since impregnate with an issue, which by the same divine blessing is now brought forth, a living male child called the marriage of strength and time, and which happily may shortly be surnamed a self-motion. I don't know how that works as a, as a baby name, but anyway. The 1651 pamphlet Invention of Engines of Motion opened with the translation of a passage from Bacon's New Organon, praising inventions as new creations and imitations of God's own works. This is something of a favorite passage among the Hartlibians. Dimmick then repeated his account uh, after this bit from Bacon, repeated his account of divine impregnation, thanking God as the efficient cause and Hartlib as his proper instrument in bringing forth his infant engine, of which a model now stood ready at Lambeth to give sufficient demonstration to either artist or any other person of its benefits. The only thing now lacking was investment. As it turned out, this would be the high point of Dimmick's project in England. Before moving on, however, it's worth considering the nature of the engine's promise. Paul Slack has identified the 17th century culture of improvement in which the Hartlib Circle played a formative role with a belief in the gradual advancement of welfare that set the stage for 18th century growth. Dimmick promised something more dramatic than this. 
nothing shy of a new and near universal engine that would transform England through a chain of causes linking land tenure, agricultural labor, national population, and providential history. Yet if this vision of England as the world's garden was utopian, the results that Dimmock promised resembled those of agricultural innovations put forward by other Hart Libyans at the same time. Greater efficiency, greater profits, more industry, cheaper food. Predicated on enclosure and thus counterpoised to the egalitarianism and communitarianism of radical groups like the diggers, this was fairly moderate stuff. It would benefit landowners as well as laborers without touching the distinction between them. Dimmick's marriage of strength and time embedded God-given technological ingenuity in an emerging regime of private property and a moral framework that prized industry and condemned idleness. It made utopia realistic. As the example of the down survey indicates, projecting did not stop at England's borders. Hartlib's network included colonists in Ireland, New England, and Virginia, and it generated projects for plantation, commodity production, and trade, as well as natural histories, maps, and surveys around the Atlantic and beyond. Several figures close to Dimmock were interested in such things, men like the alchemist Benjamin Worsley, who was surveyor general in Ireland and served on successive councils of trade, or Robert Boyle, who was the younger son of the Earl of Cork and later a member of the Council for Foreign Plantations, governor of the New England Company, director of the East India Company, and a member of the Hudson's Bay Company or William Petty, who beside his work in Ireland, which we've heard a little bit about, proposed improvements to sugar production in Barbados and later purchased land in Pennsylvania. Before perpetual motion, Dimmick himself told Hartlib of mills especially serviceable to the sugar mills in Barbados. And his later projects included a scheme for improving Virginia tobacco, as well as an invention using bellows to cool meat, in effect, a kind of refrigeration system for the Navy. The nature of the sources makes it hard to say when Dimmock began thinking about perpetual motions use in the Atlantic colonies. His 1651 uh, invention of engines of motion noted the use of oxen in the Barbados and recommended the engine for grinding or squeezing of sugar canes. But as we've seen, Dimmock's interest in sugar mills predated his work on perpetual motion. So it's likely that he had such uses in mind from the start. Whatever the case, an undated memorandum about engines in Dimmock's hand spells out the effects of perpetual motion in the colonies, much as his letters of 1648 to 49 did for England. And that's the, the document in front of me. If my engine be made use of in the Barbados for grinding of sugar, he wrote, there will necessarily follow, besides all private benefits, this public advantage, that whereas they are now forced to let many acres lie for fodder for those draft cattle, winter and summer, the profit thence arising being far short of what the same land would yield if planted with sugar cans, cotton, indigo, or the like. By this means, all that land may be converted to those more beneficial uses for the great increase and trade of those more staple commodities. Much as in England, perpetual motion was justified here in terms of private benefits and public advantage. And much as in England, it would secure both these ends by reducing the need for animal labor. But whereas in England, this meant more land for wheat, more profit for rational landowners, more employment for free men and an expanded population, in Barbados, it would mean the extension of sugar cultivation and with it of slavery. Now, Dimmick's memorandum about engines does not mention slavery, but an anonymous memo on types of mills um, appears to do so. Since this latter paper, which is uh, on the slide here, is stylistically similar to Dimmick's manuscripts, it repeats many of the points that Dimmick made elsewhere about the strengths and weaknesses of different types of power, and it describes an invention that would unite strength and time. Uh, it's likely, if not provable, that Dimmock wrote uh, the memo on types of mills himself. At any rate, having compared the relative merits of wind, water, animal, and manpower, this memo brings enslaved labor into the picture while arguing for an invention that sounds like Dimmock's. Note that the author refers not to men in general, as Dimmock had when discussing England, but specifically to Negroes. But for that in the plantation, uh, in the plantations, horses, etc., are dearer and shorter lived than Negroes and more troublesome and chargeable to keep than Negroes. It is generally concluded that could an invention be found whereby the hands of four or six Negroes at a spell, the same work could be dispatched both as to strength and time, which is now done by four horses or eight cattle. It would be a noble, useful design, particularly for sugar works and merit a large reward. 
Dimex, of course, was just such an invention. Perpetual motion had other applications in other colonies. Dimex memorandum about engines advertised multiple uses for the machine in Virginia, for example. He suggested it be made use of in clearing all new plantations there from the numerous great trees now thereon growing, estimating that my engine by the assistance of six men could pull up more trees by their roots in a month than the same six men can by any strength of skill now used to rub up in a year. Having cleared the land of trees, the machine could then be employed in splitting or sawing out that timber which hath hitherto been burnt into such fit lengths, breadths, or thickness as may be serviceable for our occasion in England. As in Barbados, so in Virginia, the initial benefit would accrue to the planter, whereas heretofore the planter or adventurer, how many servants soever he carried over with him, was necessitated to spend all or most part of the first year in clearing his land of the wood, getting little or nothing, nay living upon charge in the meantime. Now he shall have a crop the first year, and his profit that way be little inferior to others. Private advantage was only half the point, however. Like other projectors, Dimmock was at pains to align it with some conception of the public good. In England, this meant more employment and cheaper food. In Barbados and Virginia, it meant speedier plantation and more efficient production of staple commodities. The public good, that is, was identified with English metropolitan access to colonial products. Yet this was not simply a mercantilist vision of imperial economy. As the memorandum about engines made clear, the material exploitation of land and people in the colonies was essential to England's moral reformation. And this is, a, this is in front of you now. Thus shall England be re relieved with one of the commodities she more than begins to want, as to say timber of all sorts. Thus by strong arguments of gain and ease shall many thousands be invited, persuaded to plant there, that now, like mere drones, live here upon the spoil of their own or other men's estates. Thus, those that remain will have more elbow room, an opportunity to thrive, having no cause to jostle or contend. Thus shall God be glorified, the gospel propagated, our sins restrained, or lessened in number at least, when the most licentious livers are removed. And so, God blessing us, our unnatural divisions will be, in a good measure, if not totally, reconciled, when one so great a cause as the desire of gain is shall be prevented, removed even, by a kind of surfeit of the things so much loved. The profits of plantation, the enticements of supposedly vacant land, and the labor of an enslaved workforce would remove the desire of gain and its sinful effects from England. Eden would be renewed at the new world's expense. Dimmick imagined a future when through the encouragement of yet further ingenuities like his, that plantation may even become another settled and mighty kingdom be decked with abundance of most rich and excellent jewels, left her as a legacy by her great-grandmother nature, but not discovered till invention brought the key, industry the brush, and diligence helped to adorn her with them. At that point, he concluded, the colonial daughter may, as in duty bound, help to sustain her aged mother's infirmities, and by her grateful and abundant supplies, cover that nakedness which through her late excess lays her too much open to the view and scorn of nations. Inventions that made the colonies a mine for the metropole and a dump for its problems would help it defy old age and escape the decline and fall of empire's past. With God's help, perpetual ingenuity would perpetuate empire. Dimmick imagined a future British empire in which technological innovation, not only his own inventions, but the providentially assisted process of ingenuity that lay behind his and others, sustained familial, though unequal, relations between metropole and colony, and fueled growth in both. Improvements to production in England would sustain a larger, more industrious, more prosperous, and more peaceful domestic population. Any excess numbers and any morally deficient groups would be drawn to the colonies by the ease of clearing land and reaping profits there. Given secure property rights, new machines would unleash the laudable and rational self-interest of the godly, and channel the licentious energies of their inferiors with equal necessity, yoking both to the common good. Yet like drainage mills in the fens, these engines also exploited and deepened divisions between England and its colonies and between different colonial spaces. While a free population flourished in England and its dregs found livelihoods and perhaps redemption in Virginia, the transformation of Barbados would be built by private planters on the backs of the enslaved. If Dimmick's vision was utopian, it was one in which a sustainable utopia at home 
required an expanding dystopia somewhere else. This is evident even if Dimmick failed to reckon with the reason, experience, or self-interest of the Africans in his imagined Barbados, indeed because he failed to do so. His project rested on a model of rationality and produced a public good that were geographically, legally, and racially restricted, not by accident, but necessarily, and by design. Projects failed, or succeeding, ceased to be projects. Through the early 1650s, Dimmick sought money for his engine with little success. By 1654, even Hartlib wrote to Boyle that, I am no more so fond as I was wont to be of the project. Dimmick might do better in Sweden, he thought, or else running a college of husbandry proposed for Vauxhall. Dimmick himself knew the exceeding antipathy that almost all men have in them against ingenuity, which causes them to reject all new inventions under the name and notion of projects. One might, he thought, instead propound a more particular application of one or two old ideas. So he proposed distinct engines for the jobs that his machine had promised to do, and he built new ones from its pieces, a bellows of a perpetual blast, for instance. But like Hope's projects sprang eternal. The restoration of the Stuarts in 1660 found a ruined Dimmick begging funds from Hartlip to perfect the machine that he once more called a perpetual motion, this time as a present for a king. What about the empire that Dimmick had hoped to power? When he began work on perpetual motion, the rise of sugar and slavery in Barbados was well underway, a point not lost on Hartlip, who noted in 1649 that Dutch attacks on Brazilian sugar mills would likely boost demand for Barbadian sugar. As early as 1650, sugar was the main source of wealth in the island. By 1660, it was virtually the sole commodity the colony produced. Small holdings vanished as large plantations took on the cost of machinery and the management of larger numbers of workers. These workers themselves were now predominantly enslaved. In 1644, there had been approximately 800 enslaved people on the island out of a population of around 10,000. By the restoration, when the total population reached about 40,000, half were enslaved a number that would continue to grow in both relative and absolute terms during the following decades. Perpetual motion contributed nothing directly to this. Indeed, for all the interest shown by projectors like Dimmick, and despite the explosion of sugar production in the years when he wrote, the mechanics of sugar milling scarcely changed between the 16th century and the 19th. Instead, as historians such as Susan Amison have argued, it was the plantations themselves that functioned during the harvest as machines as the enslaved worked around the clock to process cane before it spoiled. Another way to put this is that projects like Dimmick's revealed distinctions, illuminated possibilities, and reflected desires that were at work, but not always articulated elsewhere. An irony of perpetual motion, conceived as the marriage of strength and time, is not its futility, but the fact that it was coming to be realized by a combination of simple engineering, unprecedented mobilization of human labor, emergent racial ideology, and sheer violence. Built on these foundations, Dimmick's project reveals the overlap between the aspirations of projectors and those of planters operating at the cutting edge of capitalism and the mixture of innovation, exploitation, and force involved in the fulfillment of both. Thank you. So I will now unshare the screen, I think, so we can talk. Okay. I, I have a question that's more general about projects, but I sure. would I would save it to if anyone uh, has a question ready to go, speaking more to to the specifics of, of Dimmick and so forth. I would I would hold off on my question. This might oh sorry, Fran, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna, hi Ted, you and I were on a book uh, prize committee uh, together. And uh, so I think I know you, but I don't really. Um, I was gonna actually pull uh, Michaela in because we read together uh, Ligon's uh, History of Barbados. And so as you were talking, you know, one of the things you said early on was you would think that the perpetual motion machine and slavery would not be connected, but you rapidly showed that they're totally co connected. Um, in terms of how you conceptualize the need of plantations. And I think of the story that, you know, has the controversial story of 1619 that, you know, that the, in Jamestown, they sort of 
fall into enslavement because they need labor for the tobacco crops, etc. So I think the the connection is so there, and you let it unfold in the paper. But I thought it was incredibly fascinating, and that made it all the more interesting that the rhetoric and the passages you showed suggest no suggested no desire to avoid enslavement, yeah. right? Uh, the desire was to in, avoid uh, dependence on draft animals, which in colonial Virginia were in, in short supply, and that was a huge issue. Um, so in some ways, I think what I, one of the things I take away from the paper, which I thought was really fascinating, is that the, there is a connection, but it's not the connection that a modern listener is going to expect. Mm -hmm that it's absolutely there, they're logically connected, they're causally connected in certain ways, but the logic is not yeah. what one might first think it would be. Oh, well, then we'll have these machines and that will be better than enslaving people for reasons probably not moral but economic, but it's not even that argument. And that to me was fascinating about what you showed in your, um, in your evidence. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I, I'm still sort of struggling for how best to articulate the nature of the connection because it, you know there there is a, you know a real link between what projectors are doing and what plantations are doing and how the sort of the elements at play in you know making it, this empire productive are 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 the same for both of these groups. At the same time, um, I think I, uh, Keith. Plim I was talking about this with with Keith Climbers, um, who's you know, just just published his book on forestry and and wood scarcity. And when he heard about sort of plan to just you know <laughs> rip up trees and and turn them into boards for use in London, he just started laughing. And I, one of the things that he pointed out was the, the kind of the the degree of ignorance of colonial circumstances that goes into some of these projects. And oh, I mean, yeah. No, and uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, that's also true on the ground in the colonies, I suppose. But, um, you know, another another point where, where, you know, someone who knows anything about what these places are like would, would raise a question would be when he, or when, when I think Dimmick, uh, is describing enslaved people as, as so much easier to manage. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that sort of cuts both ways because there is this anxiety as the numbers grow that you know there's a likelihood of rebellion, there's a demographic imbalance, which is problematic. Um, but at the same time, it is also part of the later rhetoric in defense of slavery that you know this is a very this is a very manageable system. This is actually sort of paternalistic and works well. So I mean, I, I guess I can kind of see that going either way. Um, but I, I think one thing that also strikes me about this that might be very different for different projectors is, you know, Dimmick knows England really well. He knows the fans extremely well. And that's, so one set of uses that this has is, is one that, not that what happens in the fans works out wonderfully either as Eric Ash shows, but uh, at least it's coming from a position where he knows the ground in a kind of literal sense. And even I think when he's talking about Ireland, he has close contacts, you know, he's friends with Boyle, he's friends with Worsley, um, he has some kind of relationship with Patty. So he knows people who are very closely involved in plantation there. I don't know what his sources are for the situation in Virginia. I don't think he has any real sources for the situation in Barbados. Mm -hmm. um, so this sort of, there's a real difference in the degree of ignorance between <laughs> the projecting that's going on in these different places. Anyway. Interesting. Um, I'm sorry, Michaela, that I stepped on your toes because I know you have a lot to say about Ligon, so I'm going to shut up. Well, it's it's like the the question that um, that came up when I was listening um, to your to your paper that has a little bit less to do with Ligon, but um, something that I I thought was really compelling was that um, you, know, you talk about how um, Dimmick really shifts in mindset, kind of from viewing perpetual motion as, as something that's like a, a project, something that is unfinished, something that is experimental to being something that is maybe divine. And so that would just seems to be um, a tension that I, that I find to be really interesting is sort of how, and, and I guess I'm, um, because I don't know much about um, the ideas of perpetual motion, that was just something that I 
was curious about as to whether or not that um, kind of the, the I guess the, the invention, it, it, based on your paper, it seems like kind of um, perpetual motion becomes a, um, you know, it's kind of becoming this, this scientific fixture. And so I was, I was just kind of curious as you're, as you're kind of setting up the, the ideas of um, projects, projectors, experimentation, um, and in comparison with, with sort of like the route that Dimmick ends up, ends up taking, I, I just was um, interested in that, yeah, in that, in that tension. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that, unfortunately, I don't know that that ends up being a question, um, but I was thinking that that, that might be um, something um, that if this becomes kind of a, a larger project, that seems really productive to kind of take, take on that, um, that split. Yeah, I, I, that's interesting that, um, I guess it's interesting to hear you describe it back to me as a, as a split, because I, I see it um, the way you're telling me, but I, it doesn't, didn't really strike me that way when I was writing it. And I think one reason for that is that um, not all projectors, but some other Hart Libyans, and I particularly Gabriel Platts, who's an agricultural improver. He writes a couple of treatises, one on metallurgy, one on, uh, one on agriculture in 1639. So about a decade before uh, Dimmick is, is writing. In fact, he's dead by the time Dimmick shows up. Um, but he also kind of situates his improvements in this providential historiography. And in his, actually in his case, even more than in Dimmick, it's tied to an ideal of population growth. So for Platts, um, he recommends, you know, various fertilizers and, and all sorts of other schemes that will help, um, well, will help, among other things, help poor people marry and form families earlier, and so there will be more people, but they'll also improve the food supply, so there can be more people. Um, and he describes in one of his works, I think it's one of the 1639 ones, um, that, you know, all through time, population has, I mean, in, in very modern sounding terms, population has basically come to exhaust the resources available to it. And whenever that has happened, there's been a new invention or there's been a new innovation or ingenuity, which has doubled, that's his, that's his ratio, um, has doubled basically the carrying capacity of the earth. So he sees you know, the invention of the plow as one such moment when the earth was full or full to capacity such, such that it could support at the time. Then that invention happened and lo and behold, it could support more people. And now he writes, you know, in 1639, now we're again coming up to a period when we need new ingenuities to expand the capacity there to support people. And that's what we're doing. So he kind of situates the, the technological stuff. Um, you know, he has sort of a, a, a naturalistic understanding of the processes that he's using in these inventions but there's also a providential understanding of why that's happening now and why it's important. And I, I, I sort of see both of those things, and maybe I'm just reading Dimmick too much through sort of the lenses of Platts because I know more about Platts um, at this point, but I guess I sort of see him doing something similar. What's interesting to me though, given that, that you see a split there, is that there are hard Libyans for whom that doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, Petty, who's you know, active in the circle at the exact same time, he'll talk about the world filling up and he'll sort of jokingly say, well, I guess at that point, you know, there'll be the end of the world or maybe, you know, maybe Christ will come back. And, but it's all sort of, you get the sense he's not being serious. And there is a lot, there's no discussion of sort of providence guided me to this or that innovation. So there does seem to be a real distinction um, of viewpoint between or within this circle as to, you know, how to, how to understand these innovations historically or in terms of some sort of longer longer narrative. So yeah, thanks for that. Because it's it's worth bearing in mind that actually they don't all think that way. Daniel, I think you're you're still muted, sorry. Indeed I am. This past week, I've spent a certain amount of time uh, following, well, thinking about uh, contemporary uh, sort of science and research funding policy. I, I'm teaching a, an introduction, a class, an undergraduate class on, that's an introduction to the history of science and technology. And 
we've been looking at um, sort of U.S. science and technology since uh, sort of since the Cold War, basically, and it's coincided with there's a uh, legislation being hashed out right now in in the U.S. Congress about potentially um, a significantly um, a restructuring things like the NSF and rethinking uh, U.S. Uh, support for research and among other things, uh, making big increases. So that so that's been on uh, on my mind. And so on the one hand, to the extent that this might be a kind of fruitless uh, question, trying to connect things to the immediate present, uh, that's my excuse. But because of that, I've been, um, you know, I was just struck by resonances, um, terminology and the and the, the kind of larger discourses that terms like projects are are, are part of. So um, uh, so I mean, I, I, I can make a few more comments, but it's basically a question about to what extent is the kind of Oh no, you froze. <laughs> I know that was the actual question. Complementary <laughs> to that, but maybe also just emphasize, you know, highlight, calling attention to the differences can help maybe me better understand the, you know, what in terms of uh, early modern studies the history of projects is about. So I'm someone who hasn't followed this scholarship super closely, but a bit. And, you know, I feel like I know a projector when I see one. And that seems to me a distinctly um, early modern figure. But then thinking about the project that, that, that I've found uh, elusive. So you called attention to, to one thing that seems significant and right, which is the lack of, of kind of institutional structures that uh, we have nowadays. Uh, as part of the context for early modern projects and projectors. I was kind of in my head came to mind that maybe like, um, I mean, so one thing I'm thinking is, you know, are things like the Human Genome Project or I don't know, the Manhattan Project or, or Operation Warp Speed, um, to what extent, you know, are they not projects in the early modern sense? It occurs to me that, you know, is, uh, you know, Dimmick, oh, what was now? Oh, I'm forgetting this uh, analogy I had, so I'll I'll just leave it aside. But one thing uh, that's being talked about a lot in, amongst the people who discuss contemporary science policy, which ultimately always revolves around what should be, you know, the governmental uh, policies for distributing funds, um, is. Uh, not just sort of basic versus applied, but uh, the um, debates about the virtues of a model, a sort of NSF model of you know individual scientists uh, apply for their grants for their you know research in their own labs versus basically project models that go by different names, um, but right so DARPA is being held up right now it's like this model that should you know maybe change the nsf should start doing things like the defense advanced research projects uh, forgetting the last a there have been plans for creating a civilian arpa so it's about projects meaning yeah. when they talk about it it's definitely involves uh risk like you started off talking about being definitional like that that a project can fail a project is risky um but of course they're also they're big coordinated more kind of centralized complex goal oriented um i don't know there's no other word projects um so anyways it just was so resonant to me that at the risk that maybe it's not helpful to connect to uh, 2021, I, I wanted to, to give it a go. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it, it is, 
I remember when I was talking about this with Vera at the beginning when we were sort of planning the first conference. Um, it was it was it was only too easy to sort of say, well, everything's a project now, and you know, we could just sort of <laughs> spin off any number of modern things. And there are, you know, very there are, are quite real analogies to some of these defining characteristics. I do think um, I might come back to institutions. One other point that that I got from uh, Jasanoff's description of imaginaries, she actually explicitly differentiates between those and projects. And what she says uh, is that a project usually involves a single targeted technological endpoint. And that's something that that you know you you brought up too just now in your question. I think that is a key difference, because even if a lot of these projectors are making fairly specific promises about what a project is going to do. Their eye is really not so much on doing that thing as on the knock on effects, which just sort of ramify almost endlessly. So fen drainage, yes, you're going to drain the fens. And as a result of that, you're going to have you know, ground that you can plant year round. But why that's interesting is that you're then going to have the kind of people who plant ground year round who are governable in the ways that those people are. So it's it's sort of a wider set of transformations. And you see that in the perpetual motion scheme, um, where yes, it's about reducing the amount of land that's used for fodder, but that's interesting because it's going to have really far reaching social effects. Um, and some of Petty's schemes that I didn't talk about here, but that I have written about, I mean, he's trying to sort of, yeah, we'll transplant some English women into Ireland and we'll get them to marry Irish men. And that will mean that they raise Irish children to speak English and act English and identify with the English. And that'll make Ireland English. So there's sort of endless, there's a kind of new future that's pointed out by this rather than a simple problem that's gonna be solved um, definitively. And at various points in manuscripts that I didn't put in the paper, Dimick talks about I think when he's talking about the perpetual blast, he talks about this. Like ingenuity itself kind of is, is made, is perpetually assisted by these projects so that they constantly just point to yet more projects and yet more changes. So they're very, very open-ended. Um, and they also, as I, you know, this example suggests, they just sort of migrate from one context to another pretty freely. And although not everything is like the perpetual motion machine, not, not every project you know, can do 31 different things, um, it is a kind of feature of an awful lot of them that they can kind of, if they're not good for one thing, maybe they're good for another thing. Or if they don't work when I call it this, maybe they'll work when I call it something else and use it somewhere else. So there's a sort of slipperiness to them. They're not very well defined often. Um, like, you know, what, do you, what is, what does it mean that Dimmick has perfected his machine in 1649 and also in 1651, but in 1660, he needs money to perfect it? <laughs> what does that mean exactly? It doesn't mean he's a scam artist or does it mean that it's sort of, it's not, it's not yet doing the th that he wants it to do, but it's, you know, because it's, it's supposed to do different things from at different points. Anyway, I, I, I worry I'll start to sound like a projector myself if I keep rattling on, so I will stop there. But I, I do think that's one key difference. I also think the institutional point um, is a significant one because one of the one of the sort of signs that you might be a projector, I think, in this period, other than that people are calling you that, is that you're doing something that cannot be housed or cannot be done by existing institutions. So a lot of these projects kind of mark out the defects of existing trades or existing associations or academic uh, institutions, whatever they might be in this period. So they almost by definition um, come up outside of institutional spaces, even if they are themselves proposals for new institutions or for new offices within existing institutions. So I think now we have more sort of the reverse where projects are something that you know institutions do um, or support or fund. Um, where before that's uh, sort of flipped, I guess. That's a, that's a very sort of on the fly answer, but I think there's probably more to be said about that. Can oh, I, I, sorry. Sorry, I was gonna 
because it's an intimate group, this is another, I can sort of feed off of that question because yeah, I'm a, a classicist. So coming at this from a different historical angle. And so most of my connections are immediately started um, thinking about the modern world. And it just struck me how, um, I mean, maybe the question is, is this an illusion that I'm having but I, uh, or, or something that's I'm just projecting on your projectors. Um, <laughs> But it seems quite striking how many, as, as you've just sort of described, how many of these projects are really about encoding ideologies on lands and in people or inscribing new futures, some reifying, structuring the landscape around some new fantastic future. And compared to most modern projects, whether they exist in, I mean, Daniel, you talked about government funding, but I'm immediately thinking about venture capital as a type of project on or more apt for Benjamin Johnson's model of something that is not guaranteed success. Mm -hmm. um, whereas government projects tend to be things that are funded precisely because they are guaranteed success of a certain type that the moment you have a type of risk situation, you tr start to fold in private capital more and more. Um, and yet these private projects on this model, whether it's um, the new, I, little island park in New York City or someone like Elon Musk ventures to Mars, rather than create some new future, simply recode or replicate, mirror the sort of capitalist logics that they're already working within, where we get to populate Mars, but not because it will better humanity, it will give rich people another cooler place to vacation or something like this. Um, or, you know, the private par the park in, in New York, which is beautiful, tiny, and is so small and so spectacular that will require reservations and waiting lists to get on, which kind of feels like a, you know, an, a nice fancy restaurant and, and you know, another sort of um, experience that is, even though it's not quite monetized because it won't, won't be charging entry admission, operates according to the same type of logic. So I'm just sort of curious as to yeah. um, whether this is my, sort of ignorance of this period, whether these ideologies, this, these sort of imperial ideologies are so well mapped everywhere else. And this is just a matter of new territories that are being inscribed with these established ideologies or whether this is actually a moment when people are really trying to rethink what agriculture looks like. Is this sort of a, a, yeah, an expansion of established ideologies or is this unfolding ideologies? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I guess I, I hesitate to try, even try to be definitive about it because so much of what I'm familiar with is that from this one specific moment. And um, I think, you know, projecting as a phenomenon predates this. Uh, I think Vera uh, in her book takes it back to the 1570s. Um, it obviously persists through, well, you know, arguably till now, um, certainly even in something like the form that, that I'm describing into the 18th century. Um, I think there are a few sort of running themes in it, and that might kind of help situate it with respect to existing ideas or ideologies. Um, one, which is kind of to the fore in uh, in this, in, in the perpetual motion project to some extent, and in a lot of Petty's projects too, is a kind of appeal to interest and to individuals as sort of loci of interest and of rationality. So that, you know, these farmers, if only they would understand, if only they would see my machine work. And he describes actually not with a perpetual motion machine, but he also has a, a seed drill that he's trying out. And he actually has a series of letters where he's talking about, you know, how the farmers grumbled and so forth, but they had to admit at the end that it worked better. Um, so this idea that, you know, if you, if you get people to understand what their interests really are, and you can create the structures for them to, to you know, reap the profits of pursuing those interests, then they will behave in a new way. And Petty too, when he's talking about the Irish, you know, yes, they obviously they resent the English now and there are good reasons for that as, as he admits, but following this transmutation scheme of mine, 
they will see that things are better now, right? They have better houses. They don't live in wretched cabins anymore. They have gardens. They have English wives who are teaching their children English and connecting them to markets. They have all sorts of, you know, better stuff, basically, that they didn't have before. And this will change how they behave. Um, so, yeah, I think that sort of appeal to a sense of reasoned self-interest even though it's before the kind of language of that in the 18th century. I do think that's a theme that's present in a lot of these projects. I wouldn't want to necessarily say it, it, it's definitive, but it's there. Um, a, an interest in turning waste into wealth and sort of maximal exploitation of land. Um, one of Gabriel Platz's big schemes uh, which he which he thinks is going to change England and you know massively increase the population is for people to you know collect rags and old bones and shavings and whatnot and compress them and turn them into fertilizer and sell them. That's his big scheme, and it's it's really like you know recycling wealth until it becomes waste. And in his case, that's grounded in an alchemical understanding of you know how where wealth comes from and how metals and every other thing that produces wealth grow in the earth so there's a sort of there's a fancier alchemical theory behind that particular set of projects but the idea of you know, turning waste into wealth also animates a lot of 18th century projects for you know, foundling hospital the foundling hospital and various other kinds of hospitals and charitable institutions that's a big part of rhetoric around those things too you know they're saving waste people they're saving children who would otherwise die young or becoming useful you know, to the empire by you know growing up long enough to become sailors or soldiers or, or workers of various kinds. So that kind of common theme, um, that I think is very much part of an awful lot of these projects from around, I mean, I would say this, you know, the stuff I know is sort of 1630s and 40s and forward, but I think, you know, Keith might say, uh, I think he talks about Arthur Standish's forestry schemes, and that's the 16 teens. So the 17th century, broadly speaking, and forward, I think those are those are some really key themes, at least in an English context. Um, yeah. Um, I have a um, just a, a quick question, kind of on this theme. Um, I'm kind of curious about the role of like didactism. So um, something that, that Fran and I talked a lot about, um, I wrote an essay when I was a student in her class, was about um, how Richard Ligon's text is, is really doing a lot of work to sort of fit in with other didactic literature of the time, be that like a house manual, be that kind of um, travel literature that's, that's educating sort of gentlemen on um, what they should see abroad. Um, and so kind of based on, on the, the way that um, on what you were just talking through, it seems sort of like there there is maybe this leaning into or leaning towards sort of this this didactism, this like teaching people how to order their lives, te teaching people how to kind of structure things, or that if you can affect enough kind of physical change, it will then kind of affect the like the either the emotional or or the the social kind of activities of these these individuals. And so I, I was just kind of wondering if you found that all at all um, kind of in, in this, um, this like Hartley circle, or yeah. if that is something that kind of develops later. No, no, that, that's a, that's a short answer. Yes, for sure. Um, and I mean, in Dimmock's own case, uh, he proposes a college of husbandry in some detail um, that's going to, you know, teach people how to, you know, what, what these improvements might be. Um, he also, not, no, he doesn't, but there's a college of art, uh, what is it called? College of Artisans, I think, is another project that's going on at almost the same time. Um, Petty pitches a teaching hospital to Hartlib, which is kind of sort of a teaching hospital, um, but sort of like a miniature version of, of Solomon's house. Uh, it's kind of doing some of that same work uh, beyond the realm of medicine. So he writes, uh, it's called a letter of WP to Mr. Samuel Hartlow, and that's in 1648. He, so he kind of outlines actually several institutions, including what he calls literary workhouses um, for, for artisans to be educated. And there's, there's a sort of you know, theory uh, in Petty and in some other Hartlibian projectors that 
kind of carries over into the rhetoric of kind of plain language in, in Spratt's History of the Royal Society, um, where, you know, people need to be educated in things before words. And that's you know, part of this critique of Aristotelianism and sort of getting into verbal debates when you have no idea how the actual world works. So there's a sort of connection there to more high flown debates in natural philosophy in that case. But there are a lot of different schemes for yeah, educational institutions of one kind or another. And also for um, you know, what I guess are, are on the face of it kind of communications schemes like the Office of Address, um, which is a modeled on this existing institution in Paris where people came together to have scientific and other kinds of debates. But in Hartlib's hands and in the hands of the circle, the Office of Address just becomes a sort of template for gathering and disseminating massive amounts of information about all kinds of things. Um, actually, Dimmick uh, proposes an Office of Address for servants, which is basically going to be like an employment registry for every servant employed anywhere. And also, uh, we'll keep tabs on the employers so that you know employers who are bad that's noted servants who are bad, that's noted. Obviously it's harder for the employers to be bad in this scheme than for the servants. But there's a sort of you know, idea that this is gonna mold that kind of relationship too. It's not on the face of it uh, didactic, but that's plainly part of the intent is that it's going to reshape behaviors in accordance with you know, sort of transmission of information. So yeah, there's, that's a huge part of what the Hartlib circle as a whole is doing. And they're very influenced, I should say, by um, by uh, continental educational writers as well. And so, you know, translating the works of Comenius is one of the sort of projects of some of these people. And John Dury is, you know, a me fairly prominent member of the Hartlib Circle too. Um, I don't know that he's connected with Dimmick at all, but it, I mean, it doesn't really matter in a way because so many of these ideas are are a common property among them. Oh, um, first, I such an interesting uh, uh, presentation. I really, I really enjoyed it. Um, I my question is is kind of a little more abstract, um, and it has kind of to do with this concept or this concern with, um, on the one hand, maximizing productivity and efficiency within limits, and on the other hand, like kind of negotiating across thresholds or or grappling with the possibility of limitless resources or energy, as as the perpetual motions. Uh, suggest um, and the way that uh, you you might see Dimmick or these other like projectors trying to function um, within sovereign limits while producing machines that kind of destabilize the idea of um, you know like like finitude and and kind of value that is extracted from things being finite like especially when they talk about like um, you know by increasing product they're always they're always keeping a variable. Um, static when when they make their when they make these pitches when you know they say we'll increase productivity and so food will be cheaper um but only within the context of you know some other like only within the context of everyone on the planet like no one dies or gets born or all of these different ways that they like negotiate which variables are static and dynamic and, and how they generate value while trying to sell this thing that is totally um, infinite right you cut out a little bit there but i think i get the gist of it um, oh, now it says my internet connection is unstable. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> well, hopefully it's stable enough. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are, that is a, a persistent kind of contradiction to a lot of, I mean, this is not at all unique to Dimmick, nor I think is it unique to Hart Libyan schemes either. I mean, there's a real fascination with saving labor among the same people who are trying to maximize employment. And there's, often very little sense that these goals can't necessarily contribute to each other in the space where they're working. I mean, there's also no sense of, okay, so what happens when Barbados, which is not a large place, is fully given over to producing sugar? I mean, where do we go from there? Uh, and there's no, no thought of that, really. So there's a sort of moment in the present where these projects are going to Kind of transcend what anybody can imagine and then there's the far future when this colony has become a kingdom by means that we haven't investigated and we'll be able to sustain you know the mother country because 
Um, and there's a very large gray area in between those things. So yeah, I think that I don't really have an answer except to say, yeah, that's, that's a very persistent tension here. And I guess, I mean, maybe that might take one back to thinking about what the limitations are of their knowledge of these colonies, for one thing. Um, but I mean, there's no getting around the fact that he's aware of, of Barbados as a limited space, and yet he's kind of resting a very, very large future on improving production there, um, similarly for Virginia. So yeah, I, I think one of the things I, I'm interested in doing more, ideally through this project, um, is kind of investigating how, how big the, the gap is between how these kinds of things look to the projectors pitching them in London or in you know, England and how they look or how they sound or how the future is described by the people they're ostensibly doing them for, you know, planters in Barbados or in uh, Ireland. And I mean, I can say maybe a little bit more about Ireland than I can about Barbados just because I don't have the, the mastery of those sources yet. Um, nor I think for, for this particular period, is there necessarily a whole lot of material? I think there's more of it for the restoration. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's a very significant tension and maybe it reflects real limitations that I can't really, have, haven't put my finger on yet, I guess. Thanks. Well, we're coming up on 1.30. I think if anyone has one more question, maybe we can uh, stretch our, uh, our time a little bit. Um, speak now or forever hold your peace. Any more questions? I have more, but I will refrain and maybe follow up some other time. Uh, super stimulating. Um, so on behalf of, of the whole audience, thanks so much, Ted, for for joining us and uh, look forward to, I guess a couple things. When is the um, population book coming out? Uh, how, how well, it? it's, it's uh, the book is done. It's been revised. Uh, my conversation with the editor has lagged over the issue of the subtitle. <laughs> so it's like being held up by the very slightest thing. Um, I hope to have a date uh, very very soon and i'll announce it shortly but uh but I, I i should think within the year anyway or within within a year um so well we i, I look forward to that and um and i think we're all looking forward okay. to seeing how thank you so much this was really i was it was fun to present and really thank you for the questions uh it's very very helpful uh for thinking through this project thanks a lot Okay, and maybe in some future uh, reality, uh, you can come in person. And oh, I'd love to. I mean, I was supposed to be there, not there, or there, but at the Huntington this year. And then, uh, oh, did... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, enjoy really being there. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, Ted. Thank you so much. This is really interesting. Thanks, Thanks so much as well. <laughs>